Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all here. This is the first of five uh, public conversations that are um, in conjunction with what we call Point Counterpoint, a series devoted to bringing a eloquent, sharp, provocative thinkers uh, across the ideological, ideological divide in order to make us think and sharpen our own views, particularly the views of the students, so that we don't end up, or at least try not to end up in a bubble. Um, this year, we are devoting the entire series to democracy and language. It's called The People's Tongue. It's a book also that I edited and came out last year, and John has a one, one piece in the book, the, the one actually that ends the book. It's an anthology published by Restless Books, also a sponsor, along with Amherst College, of the series uh, in which presidents and educators and translators and activists in all kinds of people, lexicographers, debate how the English language has changed over time. Democracy and language, it is frequently said that in a country as divided as ours, where the two political parties not only can't work with each other, but at times it appears as if they are not speaking the same language, they have a different vocabulary, it is very important to reflect on what our language does time and time again as a strategy to fortify our, our the, the tissue that brings us all together, especially as, it's, as that tissue involves the, the new generation, the students that are going to be the ones at the helm in the future. It is an absolute delight to be here with my friend, uh, and colleague, and actually also bizarrely a relative, John McWhorter. We are, we have a family. It's in very family. complicated. It's very complicated. We, we're not going to uh, waste time on that, but uh, <laughs> we are part of a wonderful family. Um, John and I have done this type of schmooze talk um, a number of times at the three Tenement Museum, times. three or four times. Tenement Museum, Planet Word, that wonderful museum in, in, in D.C., uh, and uh, I forget where else. And so it's, uh, I want to prepare everybody. It's a <coughs> back and forth. It's him at the center. Uh, I ask some questions. On occasion, I dissent and provoke myself. Uh, it will last probably 40, 45 minutes, the, the, that meaty part of the afternoon. And after that, we open it to... The, uh, opened it to a Q&A. Uh, I want to thank, before I tell you more about the Q&A, I want to thank everybody that has been behind putting this together. Um, it all feels wonderful just seeing you here, but there are so many individuals that are involved in orchestrating the series and events like that. Uh, and thank you, Amanda. Thank you, uh, the folks in IT, Marcus and David and Peter. Thank you, Heloise. Thank you, the funders who originally started this, alums that were very worried in 2016 that we were not listening uh, to the rest of the country after such a traumatic, seismic presidential election. Uh, Heloise, who is also my student, has a microphone when we open the Q&A. Raise your hand, she will go to you. We have a lot of people online listening to this, and we are also, if needed, uh, be sending my way maybe one or two questions that are, that are coming from the audience. Uh, otherwise, it's real. We are here, I think, with John McWhorter, and that is, that is, it's pretty real. It's pretty real. It's as real as it goes. <laughs> John, thank you really for being here. Um, there's so much that uh, I want to ask you, and I probably should start with one that is likely to be provocative. One of your books, by the way, books are on sale here, Amherst Books and Nat uh, uh, organized that part. One of your books is called Woke Racism, 
And the subtitle, and correct me if I don't get it right, is how a new religion uh, undermines... What's the subtitle? <laughs> Do you remember it? This is not false humility. It's just I'm already on to the next book. <laughs> how a new religion maybe is undermining black America. Black America. So I would, love, <coughs> I would like to start by asking you to define, as if you were a dictionary, the word woke, wokeism, and to reflect after that on why you conceive it or perceive it as a religion. Maybe that came from the publisher in order to, to make the book more you know, appealing. Um, but certainly, in what way is it uh, affecting the lives of black Americans in, at this time? Um, that title was created by the editor. Um, I and some other people resisted it for a while because it seemed a little, little pushy. But then I realized the truth is that's the book that I wrote. And yeah, your title does have to get a certain amount of attention. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't avoid that. You have to have a snappy title. And I thought, I guess that is what I mean. But the word woke is a really useful example of how quickly language is changing these days. Because what woke means circa, say, 2016, is that you are aware of structural factors and larger factors that affect the lives of people who are not advantaged. And it was used mostly by black people. It was a neutral or positive term. And it meant mostly being aware of certain realities from the left. That's what it meant. That's not what it means now. It's interesting seeing journalistic discussions where people are asking what it means or when did it become a slur, et cetera. But the truth is it has become a slur. It's done something that we know words do all the time. It has become pejorative. Most words, if they are in the middle, if they're going to become positive or negative, there's a tendency in lexical development. Most words become negative. That's something about the human spirit, apparently. But woke did that. And so now woke refers to a person on the radical left who has certain feelings about battling cis-heteronormativity and whiteness and feels that to counter their perspective deserves ostracization from society. That's what woke refers to now, such that the people who for better or for worse, fit that definition, now would rather not be called woke. There are other, there are other terms that they use to refer to themselves. So, so, the, so the word woke in this description has been appropriated by the right in order to describe the, re the left that is uncomfortable having been the one that originated. Well, I think that the right did the same thing to woke that they did to PC. Yeah, I was going to ask you about political we're correctness. Old enough to remember when politically correct was said with a smile. It was by yeah. people on the left. Someone would say, I am politically correct. The right changed that, and that's yeah. exactly what happened to woke quickly because of modern technology. And is this a mechanism of stealing away from the other side a word that the other side initiated or that initiated somewhere but became uh, uh, a way to describe that uh, a feature of you would say any society is it more radicalized the words change into bad mm -hmm. now more because we are in such tension between the political views or this is just a Darwinian natural process that would happen regardless of who where we are as a nation it's happening more because of the polarization, I think, and that the nasty polarization we think of today, back in the 80s, we thought polarization was the worst that it could ever have been, and people thought that in the 70s as well. Yeah. It's really a late 20th century phenomenon that has really taken a jump lately. But yeah, that does happen because of battles and, and, and the urge to make fun. Really, PC was a matter of making fun of the left, and so was this new use of woke. But the... The, the pejorification, it's usually as mundane as, think of this one, reduce. What reduce means is to lead again, again to lead. Reduce in 1400 could mean either that it got better or bigger or that it got worse. It used to be that the army was reduced to their former size or 
the man reduced in weight. It became the bad one, the, mm-hmm. the negative one. So now we, we can't imagine saying reduced to the form of glory. That's normal. But what's going on now is kind of a subset of that. And having, I mean, working as a, aside of being a, a teacher and a writer, also being in, as a, a publisher and, and knowing marketing, um, sometimes a writer will be f- pushed against the wall to use a subtitle that they don't like. But you don't seem to be uncomfortable with the word religion to re- describe woke and wokeism. Um, mm-hmm. In what way is it a religion? Is this that it, it, it is defining a fervor, a faith, a disconnected with the divine, disconnected with other aspects of traditional institutionalized religion, but that creates <coughs> that type of you know, absolute devotion? I wouldn't... It's not about the devotion. I, I do believe that it's a religion. And as I predicted when I was writing that book, there's major pushback against that. A lot of people think I shouldn't call it a religion. But frankly, it's what I meant. And I really do believe that if a Martian anthropologist observed the extreme members of this, frankly, religion, yeah. they would see no difference between it and anything that we happen to apply the label religion to. And what I just meant by religion is that an aspect of most religions is that there is a part of it where you're supposed to just go on faith and logic is not supposed to matter. That's part of what most religions are, especially the ones that we're familiar with. And when it comes to that extreme kind of ideology, I started noticing back in about 2015, and without any great animus, it just it occurred to me first as just an interesting phenomenon that there were people who were harboring a certain kind of socio-political position where the issue was not considered something that you were going to actually have debates about, that facts don't matter. And frankly, certain more specific parallels with specific religions, there being the idea that if you don't think like them, you have to be chased away. It reminded me of heresy. Or the way that often... In a religion, we use language. And so to talk about Judgment Day, you can only be so specific as to how that's going to work. Is Judgment Day going to take place in here? Like, is it going to be people sitting in chairs? Is there going to be the judge here? Where will everybody go when that happens, et cetera? You're not supposed to ask, and I certainly wouldn't. But there are other things like that in the what we could call the woke religion. And so, for example, when America comes to terms with racism, Now, racism exists. Racism is something that must be addressed and suppressed. But when America comes to terms with racism, that doesn't mean anything. It has no correspondence to anything anybody would actually connect with a plan. What would the terms be? Who would decide that we had come to them? Is it America or is it the world? What would happen after that? You're not supposed to ask that any more than you're supposed to ask on what premises would Judgment Day take place, where would you put the porta potties, etc. You don't need <laughs> you don't need to ask. And so I just started thinking part of why it's so hard to have constructive discussions with a certain extreme type of woke person is because of this religious frame of mind. And then in 2020, people in that frame of mind actually started bowing down on the pavement in front of the feet of black people. And I started noticing and being sent evidence of people in academic departments saying going to the Black Lives Matter march is something you can think of as a kind of religious devotion. People actually saying it before I had written Woke Racism. So I think it's a useful parallel because I think that particular divide frustrates a lot of people. And what I was noticing is there are times when logic isn't going to work. You have to understand that you're dealing with a frame of mind that you might compare to trying to talk somebody out of believing in Jesus or something like that. And I didn't like writing that. And I had actually thought, by 2020, I thought I would never write a book about race again. Articles, yes, not books. It's unpleasant to write something that's 200 pages long where you know a lot of people are going to be mad. Nobody enjoys that. But by June 2020, with the help of the (laughs) pandemic and bourbon, I just thought... Somebody needs to write this one who, that was you. who is, you know, middle-aged, black, and writes fast. And I just figured, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. And I did it. <laughs> you, you said it very fast, but you don't like getting people mad? Not particularly. 
it doesn't ruin my day. Like it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't scare me. Yeah. But I don't sit thinking this will get a rise out of people and make me some money. That's not fun. <laughs> the books that I really like are the ones where I'm just cracking jokes and being myself. Woke <laughs> racism was not fun to write, but I thought I needed to write it. One of the your recent articles and using the word recent is hard because there's a, so many that come our way and, and it's it's delightful uh, and it has been about anti-racism uh, and the the whole debate uh, connected with one of the professors at a uh, Boston University what are some of some institutions like this immediately after the George Floyd uh, embarked on a, a collective discussions on anti-racism. I doubt there's a there's a, an academic environment in the United States that didn't in some ways enter yeah, that debate. Exactly. What are your views from 2024 on how we did it, how how real, how fake, how how useful? <coughs> <coughs> Sorry folks, I have <clears throat> I'm recovering from bronchial asthma. It is not COVID. It is not tuberculosis, which is what it sounds like, but I'm sorry that you will hear some sounds. Anyway, sure. anyway. Yeah, yeah. so the anti-racism, John, um, where do we stand? Was that, uh, was that a movement, a period, uh, a medicine uh, that uh, cured us of anything? <laughs> you know, Ilan, the thing is, the history is still being written. And I think of it now as being 2024, a certain distance from 2020. 2020 and 2021 were a, a time, a particular time, that I think we're now beyond, and there's been a pendulum shift back towards the middle. But what stuck in me about 2020 and 2021 is that I think things went too far. And what I mean by too far is two things. One of them, which I think is just fact, one of them is going to make me sound not very cuddly, but I, I can't help it. One of them is that there was a call, especially in environments like this, academia and the arts, to focus everything on anti-racism rather, rather than it being one of, say, 25 things. I don't think that that's a self-standing imperative that one must embrace. Anti-racism is important, but should it be the fulcrum? And starting in 2020, after the murder of George Floyd, we were told that it must be the fulcrum. And if you don't believe that, you should be fired. And a lot of people got fired in 2020 and 2021. People who for the same transgression now are not being fired, but it was scary to watch it then. I didn't think that was right. I thought that people with a fringe view were being given major authority out of people's fear of being called racists on Twitter. And I can put myself in the mind of a, of a white or non-black person who doesn't want to get called a racist on Twitter. I get it. But that can't be allowed to run a whole society. It bothered me. And then the other thing was that in 20 and 21, there was a call to change what we think of as standards. This is the uncuddly one. There was an idea that if we have a sense of what standards are, if there seem to be certain discrepancies between what white and brown people get, then we have to question the standards. And there's room for questioning standards. I completely get it. But it became really extreme in those two years to the point that I felt that black people were being condescended to. And so one random example, and one that really doesn't have any great world impact, Princeton's classics department decided to not require classics majors to learn Latin or Greek. And the idea was that that would bring in more black students, the idea being that it was an unreasonable mm -hmm. request. I, I don't agree. And I could mention W.E.B. Du Bois 125 years ago, but I don't think I need to, even just today. Right. If you're a classics major, you should know either Latin or Greek. That's it, whatever color you are. And it's not harder for black people. Yeah. And that's what I was getting from that. Too much of that in that era. And I felt this is bad for black people. What made me start drinking the bourbon and writing the book on that porch, <laughs> it really was Jack Daniels, was that I thought I must speak up for this. Yeah. And I'm glad I'm not young anymore because I can't be told that I'm too young to say it. And I thought it would ha has to be a black person because then fewer people will call me a racist. And yeah. the ones who do, everybody knows I'm not a racist. And I just figured, got to crank this out. So I did. And you know, Ilan, I just got a copy of it in Portuguese. 
it's actually being translated into other languages. Yeah. So racismo woke. It's <laughs> it's it's getting around, and that was the idea. It has nothing to do with the sales. I just wanted people to hear that view. Fantastic. So, um, does the color of your skin, John, allow you to say things that the rest of us cannot say? Yes. And does that come with limitations as well as responsibilities? And is that something that a Jew like me can do with Jewish topics or a Latino can do with Latino topics? Um, does that end up creating silos for all of us where we can say things that belong to our group, but we cannot say others that belong to society in general uh, because we will be called a racist or an anti-Semite or anti-Latino. Sure. The responsibility is what's important. And so there's, there are things only you can say. There are things only I can say. And sometimes our fellow Latinos and or black people might wish that we weren't saying it, yeah. but we can say it anyway without experiencing what the white person would. But that means you have to be very careful that you're not just throwing out red meat. I always try to think to myself, what is the purpose of saying this? Yeah. And the purpose can't be that I'm just venting about something that bothers me. It has to have a larger purpose than that. But yeah, definitely, without a doubt. When you write, when you write your columns now for the Times, but before for the Atlantic and other places, it, do you have a particular readership in mind? Are you more careful with one readership that is part of a larger mosaic of readers than others? Um, or given that these are national publications, maybe international publications, there is no way to compartmentalize the various readers, and so one writes for everybody. No, I do write. I write for two people. And I've never thought about this until right now. It's two people. It, they're both women. One of them is Shira. Shira is 50. She lives in Connecticut. She has two and a half kids. She went to this school, roughly, and she is a liberal, as we used to say. She's worried about what she sees coming from the hard left, but feels like she's maybe supposed to agree with it because that's morality. But she knows where she really stands. She's not a conservative. Rhonda is a black woman. She lives in Philadelphia. She's about 50, and she has a strong sense of racial identity, but understands that, for example, she has a hard time wrapping her head around a lot of what somebody like Ibram Kendi thinks. Is she supposed to be racially loyal, or is she to question? How much can she question without being a traitor to her race? I imagine those two women reading it, and I'm thinking, I want to get, I want to, get to them. I don't know why they're women, but they are, and um, so it's them. It's but you don't write for Maria Stella, who's 50 and lives in Los Angeles and is worried about the surge of immigrants that are arriving in that part of the country. She herself is a descendant of Mexicans. Or you don't write for a Julieta, who is married to <coughs> an Anglo, but is from Puerto Rico, and lives in Houston, Texas, and is also 50. It's mostly Northeast, your audience? Yes, because that's what I know. And what's the Northeast? And Julieta doesn't write me much, is another thing. Oh, it's oh, also okay. who, who I hear from, oh, okay. partly. I don't hear from many Latino people. And in what way? No? Actually, no. No, and if I do, me. if I do, except you, yeah. and if I do, if, and if we're going to keep up with these names, yeah. it's it's Manuel and Jorge, but it wouldn't be Ana Maria, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure why that is. And, and to what degree, John, are you uh, not only reading what they write, but catering your next column to them? Do they affect how you write? No. Um, what I write is... John, what's on your mind this week? What's something interesting that you found out last week that you'd like to share? Mm -hmm. One time out of five, that won't be anything that anybody would want to read. And so, for example, George Washington Carver, you know, he has the um, 300 uses for the peanut or something like that. I found out about a month ago he had a soprano speaking voice. He literally, he talked literally like this all the time. And there are recordings of him in the 30s, crystal clear, 
He had a soprano voice. And there's some very interesting thing, reasons why. You wouldn't think he had a soprano voice, but he did. I started to write about that. And then I thought, you know, that has no bearing on anything except that I found out. So it has to be something that's genuinely interesting. But then once I do it, the idea is just, is this a, some vaguely novel insight? And then I guess what comes then is, would Shira and Rhonda find this interesting? Okay. I don't think that literally, but yeah, that, that is my process. Going back to the subtitle uh, of your book, and I'm going to move elsewhere, I'm, I'm I promise. <laughs> I'm trying to think what the subtitle is, but we're close. The religion, whatever. Yeah. Um, and I, my oldest son, Josh, uh, uh, who's a DJ, uh, tells me that using the term African-American places me at a period of that I should be in the Smithsonian as an artifact. Um, what are you supposed to use? You, so what are the, what, when you use black, when you use Afro-American, when you, what, what do you, how long do this, because we're going to talk about Latinx in a minute, how long do these identity categories last? What is their clock? Um, where do they come from, and when do they stop ticking? They don't stop ticking. They don't. And it generally, it's about a generation, and if they're pejorative associations with the label, then the gnats are going to settle down on the new word over time, and then you need a new one. And even with African American, I never, I never liked it when it came in in about 1990, and I was, you know, 20 something at the time. But I remember thinking, we're not African, not enough for this to make sense, and there are too many. African immigrants now and their children. They're African American. I'm not. And so I've never resisted it too vocally, but I've written a couple of pieces where I've said I'm not going to use it in writing and I don't use it in real life any more than I absolutely have to. Black is fine with me. Black American is fine with me. In answer to a possible question, when I'm writing to Shira and Rhonda, I write black with lowercase letters because I think the whole issue of capitalizing it is trivial. I think they're real world issues. The Times capitalizes it, and I just figure they'll do it, and I don't care, but I'm okay. not. And so there's that. But these things change, just like Hispanic, Latino, right. etc. What your son is referring to, I think, is that it's time for a change from African American. I'm hearing that the kids are now going back to black. I keep hearing that, but I haven't actually heard it in practice. But the yeah. reason that people are itching is because African American is now beginning to be associated with the same sorts of things that made people feel there was a new term needed in 1989. Yeah. That kind of thing. So let's talk for just for a second. And you and I were doing this on Monday in one of the in a radio show about the term Latinx, and it is not. I don't want to put you on the spot here because that's that's a topic that really belongs it's more yours. to me, right? Yeah. But I want to go back to a scene that you described in that radio show of walking the streets of Jackson Heights, where you live, mm -hmm. and listening to certain words but not others. You don't hear. That's how you put it. You don't hear. Anybody outside an academic environment like this using Latin X? I don't hear it either. Never I, in eight years. I, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's <coughs> only about two and a half to three percent of the entire U.S. population that uh, uses Latin X, and all of them are in academic environments, or most or of arts. them. Are. Yeah, or yeah. the arts, or the arts. Um, but then you, you know, we have gone from a uh, Hispanic to Latino, Latina, a uh, Latino slash Latina, all those terms that we know. But Latinx was, is, has kind of been engineered um, in this environment to be PC. Um, you were talking, and this does correspond to you, about the pronoun day. Mm -hmm. The pronoun day, and I forget, I should have checked before uh, our conversation. I think the Merriam-Webster dictionary. They have approved that. They, appro they not only approved it, I believe it was the word of the year mm -hmm. in 2022. I, I forget if it was 21 or 22, but probably it's 22 because it's that... Uh, Wasn't it a little... This doesn't matter. I thought it was earlier, but let's say it was 22. Let, let, just for yeah. the sake of the discussion. Yeah. It, and and what, do, what they mean by word of the year is the word that has... The, that people have keep on looking up online uh, to find 
how the dictionary is defining it. And the word day has been in the dictionary for a very long time, but it hasn't been in the dictionary with the definition that has recently arrived, proof that dictionaries are not static. And if they are static, they're dead. Um, the word they, you said in the radio uh, dialogue, you hear in Jackson Heights. So talk about the word they as a, as a pronoun, singular, and not only plural, your views on it, your acceptance, your rejection, and the tension between the street, if there is such a thing, and academic environments like this. Yeah, um, the new they, I think, is fascinating and welcome. Because if there are people who don't want to be referred to as he or she, you can create a pronoun. You can create Z or something like that. But new pronouns almost never catch on in languages. You wish that they would, but they just don't, beyond a small in-group. And so you have to have something that we already have. And it can't be we, it can't be I, it can't be you. English is kind of pronoun poor. And so it's going to be they, because it was already being used in the singular, in sentences like, tell each student they can hand in their paper. Now, the new usage, my girlfriend Roberta is in the hospital and they want a haircut before they leave, that new they, that's tough if you were a certain age or beyond when people started using it. It can be confusing. You wonder where the language is going and why that happens so quickly. But what I was saying on the radio with you the other day is that the people who are in Jackson Heights not saying Latinx are using they when they're, say, 20 years old and younger, when people don't wish to be referred to by one gender. And so I think that it's always going to be a little tricky for people who were not young when this happened. But because younger people use it so fluently, I think that it gives every evidence of being the way that you go in the future. And actually, the book that I just finished is, it's called Pronoun Trouble, and it's one chapter for each pronoun. And one thing that I say in the they chapter, there are languages that are a lot like English in overstretching both you and they in that way. And in those languages, people don't bump into trees. They, they get along just fine. <laughs> and so if they can do it in New Guinea, then we can do it here. Yeah. And do you think, it, it was also part of the conversation we were having on the radio, John, do you think that they will last in that usage? I don't think Latinx will last. It, the question is less about these two words than about a, a, a movement for a word that can last. What makes the transformation of a word last in what makes it succumb or perish along the way after some attempts to push it forward? I think if societal conditions f beg for that word, and if the societal conditions stay the way they are, such as our questioning traditional categories of gender, <coughs> then I'm imagining that it will, it will stay. Um, it's possible that we'll look back on it as something trendy from about 2015 to 2035. But listening to young people, it seems to me, I don't see why they would stop using they. We just have to see. I think we'll know in about 10 years whether it'll stick. Talking about young people, <coughs> one of your recent columns is about the word like. Yes, that one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, on occasion, tell my students that if I could, if I, accumulated all the extra likes that show up during the semester, we probably would have only two-thirds of the classes. Um, and yet, they can be very, they're they very charming, uh, those likes. They can be annoying. Reflect on the word like, your, some of the stuff that you wrote, and some of the reactions from Rhonda and Shira. <laughs> Maybe they are not the right people to read that quote. R Rhonda and Shira, Cold. they're a little impatient about like those two. <laughs> but um, I actually, the way like is used by young people, it's really, there are about five flavors of it. It's grammatically and semantically very complicated. And it is a fascinating little marker. And what made me write that column, talk about what interested me mm -hmm. the week before, somebody sent me these recordings it's a family in Connecticut in 1964, and they're in therapy. 
and this guy had tapes made, and now most of the people are no longer with us. And he sent me the tapes because he knows that I'm interested in what casual speech was like in the past. So I listened to some of it. I mean, it's like 20 hours of these people's problems in 1964. <laughs> but you listen, and you keep finding, and it's five or six different people, why do they keep pausing? They keep on... And it's not pathological, but I thought the reason they sound funny is because there's no such thing as the new like yet. Mm. Now people would fill in those pauses with like. Mm. And I remember thinking, that's an interesting thing to write a column about. But the thing about the like is that I have to be honest with myself. I'm always talking about how subtle it is and how interesting it is. With my students, I did a passage in that piece where I had recorded one of my students for a different reason. And she's probably got an IQ of 200, and she really does use like about every five words. And I was listening to her, and I was thinking, wow, this is a lot of likes. And I'm thinking, like is not about hesitation. I understand that. But I, I'm pretending when I say that this is not less aesthetically appealing to me than somebody <laughs> who doesn't use like that much. And also, watching my daughters start to use like 9 and 12, it's one thing to say, oh, like is the demotic, wonderful word, and then your own kids are saying, well, it was like fun. And I've had to make sure not to say to them, what do you mean like? Because yeah. <laughs> you can't help having certain Mystery. prejudices. Yeah. But, one, the like is not going away. It's, that's definitely going to stick. We're going to see people using like that way with gray hair very, very soon. Mm. And really? there are, I guarantee you, the, 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 I'm thinking of the woman who, she's 20. Yeah. When she's 40, she's going to have, by then, one kid, and she's going to be graying at the time. But, temples. John, I actually think that uh, by the time someone is 40, those likes ha are no longer there. I think it's mainly... A feature of of youth of youth. Not I don't hear it that often among older older people. I'm older, meaning thirty, forty, fifty. Um, do you, Elon? I do wow. because I've actually thought it like is not new, and I thought it's at the point where people we should be seeing people who are getting along, yeah. who are using it not as much as Julia, my student from then, yeah. but much more than their mothers did. You should just take a listen around campus. You have to pay attention. Yeah, just if you're in a cafeteria or yeah. something. It is now listen to people who aren't talking to you or you're in, at the <coughs> bank. So if it wasn't in the 60s, mm -hmm. it's now. Mm -hmm. And you're saying it's, going, it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. Why did it show up? What was the... No one knows. Isn't that interesting? No one knows. It's like nobody knows. Why then? It's just it, it, it took off. It filled in a space. Yeah. But the thing is, why hadn't that space been filled in in 1915? Yeah. Nobody knows what happened, and well, I wish somebody would figure it out. At that was it what? Was it filled in 1915? Not as much as like. And so in that column, I wrote that I was talking to a literally 100-year-old man in 1993. And I ran out of conversational material because I didn't really know him. Mm -hmm. And so then I thought something with language. And I said, okay, so when you were a young man, Murray, you know, did people say something too much? Like there was no like, but I was thinking this man lived during the Great Gatsby time. He was at those parties. Yeah. First I asked him, did women in the 1920s wear the same perfume as older women wear now, or do they wear different perfume? Yeah. And he said that they were wearing the same perfume that they wear as old women now. So that means flappers wore Chanel number no. five. So he told me that. <laughs> then I thought, well, what about language? And he said people said you know too much. But they didn't say you know as much as people say like now. Mm. So no one knows. And I wish somebody would figure it out because I, I draw a blank. Why 1979, which is around when it started yeah. percolating? We're going Maybe one or two more questions from me, John, and then we open it to the audience. Again, <coughs> uh, Heloise has a, a, a mic, and if you raise your hand, she will move around and uh, give you the mic. Um, John, I, wanna, I want to um, ask you about, you have another book uh, about, uh, and I forget exactly how many, strong words. It's not strong. It's obs oh, yeah. obscenities and um, profanities. Curses. Curses. Yeah, slurs. Yes. Right. Um, I'd love, I, it's a very big topic. I am absolutely fascinated with it. The difference between uh, cursing in, in American English or in one part of the country and in another part or in different languages. Um, do you think the words that we use for cursing uh, wear out? 
and become neutral so that we need new curse words because there's no language that cannot function its economy without curse words. If so, why? Why do we need dirty language? What function? And that would assume that dirty changes over time. It does. <laughs> That's Make like, do the right. book. Yeah. Right. Um, dirty does change over time. And so it used to be the body. And I you know it used to be religion. And so damn. Then it became the body, you can imagine. And then it became current slurs against groups, which have the same significance to us that, if I may say it once, the word fuck did to people 100 years ago. And all languages have a way of marking an eruption or some deliberate transgression of etiquette with an utterance. Curses aren't really words. They are interjections that used to be words. Right. And so you need that. Not all languages do it with there being separate words that you use for it. There's some languages where the way you do that is to use pronouns differently. That's mostly how you curse in Japanese. But there's always some way of doing it. And they do wear out. And so, for example, you know, even my kids call nine nasty words the fuck book. And that means that they're using the word. And I'll bet that wouldn't have been allowed in many families, say, 50 years ago. But to be honest, <coughs> that word is not as strong to me as it was to my parents. Yeah. With my parents, but if something still strong. bad happened, they said, they said shit. Fuck was for something extreme, and I don't remember ever hearing either one of them say it. Where they said the S word, I now use the F word, frankly, in front of, in front of my kids. Yeah. And I think I'm ordinary in that as a middle class person. As a person middle class and educated and not and rather starchy. Yeah. But it's just the, the word doesn't. But you notice that they tend to have longer versions. And so if I may, folks, damn is one thing. But then there's goddamn, which just gives it more power. There's shit, but there's also bullshit. And there's fuck. But then motherfucker, the way we generally use it, doesn't make any sense. Right. It's just that it gives the word some weight that it had lost. Yeah. And so there's a lot in those little words. And with that book, actually, that was the one where I had no idea woke racism was coming. But that was the one book I wrote where I thought, I'd like to have one where a whole bunch of people are going to read it not just the usual 10,000. I thought, if I'm going to go around once, I want one that really gets on the list. And, and I was... thought the one topic that that's going to be, I either have to write about language on the internet, which I don't care about, or it's going to be a book about cussing. Yeah. And my agent said, good. Yeah. And it worked. And now I can, I can die. And so <laughs> that is why I wrote that one. I wanted just one that would get that far up on the list. Now, for a long, long time, a veteran magazine like The New Yorker would not accept the word fuck. It, the OED did not include the word fuck, neither did Merriam-Webster, up until, I think, 1974 or 1975, because it wasn't prudish. It wasn't, you did not include in a dictionary a word that people, that you didn't want people to use, a prescriptive oh, no. approach. That's right. Uh, but it's one of the most versatile words in the English language. It's an advert, a noun, you can turn it into anything. Spectacular. Spectacular. What you can do with it. And you never know what word that's going to be. In Russian, right. the way you do that is with the word for, if I may, dick. The way they use their word for that is just so fertile. Yeah, the, the, way that, <laughs> the way that you say something like, you know, what kind of day did you have? Yeah. And you had a bad day. One way to say it in Russian is same dick. Yeah. It's like, that's beautiful. Well, you were talking about motherfucker. <laughs> uh, sorry that we kind of took this detour. Uh, for, um, in Mexico, there's no worse curse than to bring something that connects with your mother. Yeah, there's uh, a mother, yeah. Puta madre, chinga tu madre. Those are the strongest, <laughs> most lasting and offensive of terms because, this, because of the sacredness of the mother. Yeah. Right. So um, it's the word <laughs> itself, mother, becomes part of the curse only when you attach it to these other parts. But right. it, when you do... Whew, That's the whiskey. That is the whiskey. Yeah. Last... Uh, uh, or the bourbon. Uh, <laughs> last but not least, uh, John, I want to go back to um, condescension. 
Uh, you talked about it before. And uh, you were very brave. It seemed to me you're very brave, particularly brave when you were talking about the, uh, the situation at Harvard with the president uh, and plagiarism mm -hmm. and uh, having chosen her the way she was chosen. Uh, now that we are a few months away, uh, I'd like to get your reflections on that episode in this context. I think we live at a time, John, and I think you and I have talked about it and assume you will agree with me, where higher education, where what we do in higher education is questioned by the larger society. Uh, the, the price of sending one's kid here, the isolation that these places are in, the fact that we <coughs> can be not in step with, with society, their suspicion. This has always been an anti-intellectual country, but we are at a particular time. And so I wonder to what extent that episode and what is happening these days in academia, connecting race and connecting anti-Semitism, where does it leave us as th supposedly thinking creatures here that are in charge of helping the next generation find the tools to think clearly, to think wisely as they enter the world? Very tough stuff. One answer to that question, and um, did I do it for the Times or would they not publish that one? Mm. Yeah, I had to put it somewhere else, mm. um, which doesn't happen much, but what I believe is that you can't have a campus culture that's supposedly devoted to anything like free speech or open discussion if the slightest offense that you cause to a black student means that someone gets expelled or the whole campus does a teach-in for a week. While, under the current circumstances, a Jewish person is supposed to walk by people having posters on their door saying from the river to the sea. That doesn't work for me. The tacit idea that Jews should just buck up and take it because they're basically white, whereas there's a history of racism and Jim Crow in this country, and black students should not ever be offended in any way. Really, I would say it should be somewhere in between. I think that there's an oversensitivity about what we call a microaggression to brown students. And I know that partly because I went to college in what was not exactly antique era. And there are certain things that happen where, you know, there's a lot more to life and you're going to have to get used to certain things anyway. And then on the other hand, I do think that not just Claudine Gay, but the other two presidents were caught in a tacit assumption that when the people who are getting mistreated are white, it's different because they're the ones in power. And of course, the idea that an Israeli is necessarily white, is oversimplified, but even if that weren't the case. So there's an issue there. Um, there's a condescension. If Jewish kids are supposed to put up with what I've watched my own Jewish students at Columbia putting up with, we have crossed lines of people with the Palestinian flags. I had two Jewish girls with me. And I was thinking, imagine how they must feel. And this is just supposed to be ordinary. Right. And I thought, if there were anything like this about black kids, then Columbia would be shut down for two weeks. Not right. And then when you talk about condescension, and this was hard. I, it was hard for me writing about Claudine Gay because we're about the same age, and we both are black people who grew up rather comfortable, her more than me, but still. She, she and I were at Stanford at the same time. She was an undergrad. I was a grad student. I could have met her. Maybe I did. I know what she's been through, but... When it came out that she had only written 11 academic papers, if you're not in academia, you don't really know what that means. And so I didn't write a column about it for a while. But that's really not many. I've written probably 75 academic papers practically by accident, and that's normal. I'm not bragging. There are many people in my position who've written about 150. I have had other commitments. But 11? That's really not enough. And to find out that that's what she's done, and she's been made the president of Harvard University, it's condescending. 
what made the decision, and it was clear what it was. It was what used to be called tokenism. Now, I didn't say anything at first, and I had some tweets where I said, hold off, folks, you know, maybe we shouldn't have to write so many papers anyway. I re and then I did a Times piece where I said, nobody reads those papers, including mine. Right. So I said, maybe we just need to change what standards are. Right. But then it turns out that she's got all, <coughs> she's got all the plagiarism. Not plagiarism, plagiarism, but lazy plagiarism. It's clear that she had her mind on things other than being a scholar. And so if it's just one thing, and I said on Twitter, basically it's just one thing, but then it's like everything she wrote. And so finally I thought, I am going to say that she should step down because I feel that the optics here are rather awful. The 11 papers was bad enough, but we cannot have a black, not to mention female, college president of Harvard with this egg on her face. Right. And I think I was correct about that. And I felt, with all due humility, I was surprised, but that was taken as the times coming out against her. And I thought, boy, they talk about the responsibility. I had to really think about that. But she's now making a million dollars a year as a poli-sci professor. It's not like she was being cast out into the street. She feels that she was done in by racism, but I don't think so. I think that the way she was elevated was an excess of anti-racism, and it makes it look like we can't be expected to do what other people do. So it was hard. That was a, that was a journey. And I don't know how Shira and Rhonda felt about that. I think they agreed with me, and I think I needed to write what they were feeling in their guts if they did. So, yeah, but that was hard. That was really hard. I would hate to wind up in a room with Claudine Gay, but I had to write it. Are there pieces that the Times would not run? Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't like to talk about it. And <laughs> the, the times have been so good to me. They're, they're, you wouldn't know it from some of their press, but they are wonderful to work for sure. when they're wonderful to work for. But there are certain limits, and they hired me knowing that I'm, I'm you know, nasty and strange. But I've been surprised what they let me get by with. But about every six months, there's something. And one of them was that piece about about when Hamas happened, and I was just trying to say we need to triangulate between the black and the Jewish. I had to put that with the free press that Barry Weiss oh, really? now runs. They, yeah. didn't, they did not like that at the time. Yeah. And that was actually a good move because once I did that once, if they were a little itchy about something else, they knew that I might do that. Mm. And so now that they're a little bit more. But it's happened with a few things. With one of them, I think they were wrong. With one of them, they were right. It wasn't one of my best pieces, and I needed some distance from that. So there's some limits, but they do 97% yeah. of what I send. And often, if I haven't written it yet, if it hasn't gotten to the point that I've already written it, six months later, I realize, yeah, that wasn't, I, I didn't need to write that. So I have nothing but good things to say about the Times, except that now and then, like I wrote one where I was saying that the whole trans issue, I am confused about categories. I, I don't know what a man is. I don't know what a woman is. And I meant that. And it wasn't making fun of anybody. But I was thinking, everybody's thinking this. What are the categories? They didn't want that one. They didn't want They just wouldn't do it. And so and that was a good one, frankly. <laughs> and so I just kind of let that one sit. But no, generally, I do not feel especially censored. They, are, they have opened their mind on things. Why don't we open it up to sure. a dialogue? Uh, 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 Heloise is right here with a microphone. We have a question here. Uh, if you, Heloise, maybe we go first there. Raise your hand and she will find you. Uh, make sure that you speak to the microphone because not only us are paying attention, but the people online. So, like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to help you with your point. Um, I'm part of an organization that trains newly elected officials how to work in a bipartisan way. Um, one of the things that makes it difficult, and you've referenced this earlier, is different languages. I mean, it's just not Fox News and MSNBC. It's different language to say the same thing. What advice do you have for us to, for language that builds trust and the ability to see each other's values in real ways? Well, I think it's always important to specify that differing views often come from different assumptions and that 
people rank things differently in terms of priorities and that you might just hit a log jam in finding you rank this over me, but I don't, and it's not going to change. But that's important. But we do have a terminology problem these days, and we always have because the relationship between language and meaning is never precise. But there are many terms we use that it's it can be really hard to have a constructive discussion about because people mean different things by them. And so, for example, talk about how quickly woke has evolved. What do we mean by DEI? Have you noticed that just over the past six months, that's gone from referring to a certain kind of program to what people really mean is what they meant by CRT a year ago. And what they really mean is preferences and equity. What does equity mean? Well, that changed in about 20, that sort of thing. It's almost a crisis. And so lang language people, linguists are not supposed to prescribe. We only describe. Very often, Ilan, when I'm trying to write a column, more and more these days I'm having to say, linguists are not supposed to give advice, but I can't help wishing we would X. And so we need to use a lot of those loaded words more precisely. Who's against diversity, equity, and inclusion? Nobody, not a single person. But there are some people who don't understand that that's not what people mean when they're against DEI. I think there's some people who pretend not to understand, but it really makes it hard to have a constructive exchange. It's There's tough. a question right here, and I'll take this few minutes, if you, a minute. In, you know, the tension between prescription and description, as you well know, John, is a, is a well-rooted one in uh, lexicography, in linguistics. Definitely. And in some parts of the world, in the Spanish-speaking world, dictionaries still see themselves as being prescriptive. If the word fuck is in the OED, that word is not, what well, the equivalent of that word is not in the Royal Academy because I don't have, well. Because you're not supposed to use it. Well, you're not supposed to do it because a dictionary in that context <coughs> is telling people how to speak rather than people telling the dictionary what to contain, which is what Merriam-Webster tries to do or OED, so on and so forth. I remember once when I was asked to write an academic article in Spanish. I shouldn't have been asked. I don't know why the person assumed that I could do that. But I wrote it, and I can imagine what it looked like. Like, it's me <laughs> trying my best, but I don't, I don't have the idiom. They were so mean. And I've done the same thing with French and German. Yeah. And, of course, there's, it's so messy, because how do you write on that level? But with even the French, but in the Germans, it's, well, we're going to fix this, we're going to fix that. With the Spanish... And frankly, my Spanish is much better than my German. Yeah. In Spanish, it was, this is wrong, and they basically balled it up and threw it in John, my face. John, by the way, and we'll go to this question. Are you, have you experimented with artificial intelligence in, as a professor, as a columnist, as a translator? As, the other day, I was I'm putting together a book of conversations with dictionary, about dictionaries, mm -hmm. with the top dictionary maker in 20 different languages. Oh, wow. Arabic. And huh. some of them arrived in languages that I don't know. Yeah. And I used chat GPT yeah. just to find out the responses. Yeah. And it was amazingly fluid and fluent yeah. in conveying the message, almost publishable, but, you know, I don't have the knowledge of the original. So have you experimented with all this? Only a tiny bit because I'm always a few years behind and I'm too busy writing columns. But one thing that I did see it do, there was somebody who did it in front of me. It was asked to write, not that everything's about me, but it was asked to write, write a column about reparations for slavery by John McWhorter. Oh. And it, in like 10 seconds, it did. It was not a replication of any one that I've done over the past was 20 years. Was it better years. than the ones that you write? It was... It lacked a certain flash, I thought, <laughs> but it did sound like me. And yeah. then the person said, now translate into Russian. <laughs> and I was with my girlfriend, who's right. Russian, and I said, Oksana, how does this read? And she said that, one, the Russian is practically perfect, yeah. and two, it's how you would sound if you were Russian. So that's that's the one time I've seen it like work fast and magic. We have a question but, right here. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, um, I read your column this morning about. Uh, what was it this morning? It was about um, 
people using African American English. No, the before. comedian, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. So right. I thought it was great. Thank and, you. Uh, I had a student in my office this afternoon who was asking about you know what he thought about, it. and he said, "Well, he's really incorporating a habitual B into his language." He says, "He's sure it's going to be there in the language as a whole." I thought. That's great. You made my my daughter wow. does it too, and I know another guy was teaching. She teaching in Baltimore. He's a good physicist. But he said we was teaching high school kids. You know, he ended up saying, "Now, don't be don't be getting late with your homework." You know, <laughs> and he said he just, just pops out of them. You know, and I said, "Great, that's the language that should integrate." And and I but I wanted to advance a stronger hypothesis and see what you think about it. Look, they teach sign language to kindergartners. In Switzerland, they teach both the dialect and mainstream German, and half the classes in each one. Uh, in Canada, everybody has to learn French, although 90% of the people are nowhere near a French person, but it's a bilingual country, so that's a commitment they have. If there are 20 million people who speak African-American English in, in this society, why don't we make that part of the American elementary school curriculum and say this is what we expect you as an American to control in your life. And I'm wondering if you would, I've been saying this for 20 years, but I'm wondering if you would stand behind that view too. And let me, John, as you begin pondering what you will say, should we also put Spanglish there? Everybody should yes, put Spanglish? Yes, I, I, I almost added that in. I think Spanish is a legitimate. Uh, but I'm not, talking <coughs> about, I'm not talking about Spanish. I'm talking about Spanglish. <laughs> the mixing of Spanish and English that is spoken by 30 million people, some Latinos and some not Latinos. That is that. But this was a yeah, question. Yeah, I for mean that, that. So the father of my the daughter-in-law, Ricardo Otegi, has this book on Spanish in New York, and it refers to a lot of that mixing that's going on. And there's amazing prejudice too. And in Springfield, the Guatemalan Spanish speakers are prejudiced against the Dominican ones. And my daughter-in-law. She says, you know, in different parts of New York, her Spanish is treated differently. Right. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of amazing. Yeah. But, yeah, I agree. Spanish ought to be in there, too. Yeah. John? You know, Elon, I, you could convince me otherwise, but, and I, I'm speaking to Mr. Spanglish, I know. I would be more inclined, actually, if all Americans were given Spanish as opposed to, to black English because there's so many Spanish speakers in this country. Spanish is relatively easy to learn from English. And in my own experience, I noticed that really it would be better to be perfectly bilingual. I got a, a haircut the other day. The, the barber shop is Dominican. Most of the barbers don't really speak English. They think I'm Dominican because of the way I look, apparently. And so they just speak Spanish at me. And I was making my way through it. And I was thinking, I'm having to work hard because Dominican is very different. But I thought, why, why haven't I been raised doing this? And he said, ahorita, and I thought, oh, do you mean right now? And what right. he was saying was later, he was right. soon. Right. And I'm sitting here thinking there are many dialects of Spanish. Yeah, sure. Black English is felt by many people to be a cultural possession, as I said in the column. And so many people would feel that right. to learn it, like that comedian is imitating it, basically is to be infiltrating something that is not yours. Now. It's going to happen naturally in that young people are going to incorporate more and more of it organically. But in terms of lessons in it from, from the age of three, that would be a hard sell to a lot of people. But I know, I, I know where you're coming from on that because it is the youth lingua franca ever more and more. I have to think harder about that. That sounds like a topic for you know one of the yeah, one of the po <laughs> one of the points John that might just simply I might just simply add here for for people is that Spanish is the most popular popular language on campus and cumulatively there are more students of Spanish in American campuses than students of all other langu foreign languages. Yeah. I've noticed over Together. the years Spanish yeah. has passed French. In yeah. one of the absolutely in one of the big debates. Also is, can we still teach Spanish as a foreign language in the United States when it's a long time when, that it ceased to be foreign? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's quite, it, just for everybody, it, the, the title <coughs> of John's column today, if I am summarizing it pro uh, properly, is can a person who, or should a person that is not a black, can they use black English? 
And one thing that maybe you can I can bring you that the the use somebody wrote to me the other day saying I we're doing something at the Diego Rivera Museum and we want it to be in Spanglish. If we translate it into Spanglish, mm. would it be appropriation? Yeah. When somebody who is not black using black English, is that appropriation, John? Well, some people would say that it is, but this is about the, the assumptions. Is appropriation bad? And the truth is, the comedian that I write about, he's this very white 20-something comedian who, when he's being funny, slips into black English. The thing is, he's doing it right. He's grown up listening to the real thing. It's not what his grandfather would have done. He doesn't know it. He has a tweet where it's clear that he hadn't thought about it until people started making fun of him doing it. He doesn't think of it as black language. He thinks of it as just kind of hood. I've heard a lot of white kids under 40 under that impression. And thinking that if you know some of the slang, you're speaking the dialect. But this guy's got the sound. And um, I don't mind. And, you know, I'm saying that through gritted teeth because the origin of that column is me walking in front of a TV set and seeing him and thinking, who the hell is he? Why is he doing that? And then I thought, no, wait a minute, what's wrong with it? He's 27 years old. Right. He feels it as a kind of warmth. He's not a phony. It's just I'm not used to hearing it. But yeah. it, he's the wave of the future, I think. Any other, are there any other hands? I don't, there's one right here, Nishi. Um, I'm a big fan of your columns. Um, and I'm Thank sure you. you've gotten this question before, but since it's it's been bothering me for a long time. I want to hear what you have to say. So I've been bewildered, continue to be bewildered by the appeal, not of his politics, but of his personality of Donald Trump. He has a widespread appeal, and I don't understand it. I never have. But it occurs to me that he has a very unique way of speaking. And I was wondering, first of all, if you could describe what you take to be his way of speaking and whether you think it accounts in part for his appeal. Very much so. Um, it's funny, I was in the car up here, I was reading a book that addressed some of this. He, um, what you see is a kind of WYSIWYG honesty in him, which for many casual listeners means that he is authentic. And authenticity and that kind of honesty are very seductive in oratory. In a different flavor of it, the ancient Greeks cherished the same thing. In a more mundane sense, he speaks in an utterly unadorned way. It's not as incoherent as many people say. It's just that he talks the way ordinary people talk. He has no sense that there's supposed to be any kind of oratorical flair. So he just gets up there and talks, which means that it's very accessible. It reminds you of people who you knew. Specifically, what is he doing? It's not... It's not that special, really. It's He talks like a, a modestly educated white Northeasterner of the mid-20th century who's just kind of BSing. A lot of white guys like him talk that way. For those of us who've had the benefit of a certain length of years, the way Donald Trump talks is the way Carol O'Connor portrayed Archie Bunker talking. Is Archie Bunker was scripted, but it's that same voice. And so it's seductive. And to be honest, I, I, I loathe the man. I, I, the thought of him makes my skin crawl. But I have watched him making speeches. He's a lot of fun. I mean, if you can divorce the content of what he's saying, he's funny. He seems like he likes you. Because he's into himself, there's a rock star quality. I fully understand why people would cotton to that son of a... But, yeah. But you don't, you don't get it. He, I mean, there's so much fury in so much of what he says, which doesn't really fit into what you're saying. You mean the he's anger? Not appealing, yeah, and he's mean. Like, he's just... He, he doesn't hide his meanness. Which seems macho and powerful, I think, to many people. No, I don't, I don't like any of it, but I do understand. And Biden, because the flame of oratory to the extent that he ever had it has gone out, is in trouble now because he can't light up an audience the way he used to. These are very superficial traits, by the way, but unfortunately they have a way of working. Um, yes, there's, there are a couple more here. I, you know, by the, uh, by the way, um, 
John, and we are coming close to the to what wrapping those, this what up. Those cards. These are cards uh, oh, submitted from ones. the from oh, okay. online. You know what? That when putting together <coughs> the people's tongue, mm -hmm. and again, thank you for being part of this. My pleasure. Um, when I was sending out permissions, I don't know if I told you this. When I was sending out permissions, people from uh, Amy Tan and Tony Morrison or the Air States to Tony Kushner and uh, uh, Natalie Diaz, the, the poet, uh, there were two who wrote back saying, we heard that Donald Trump is in the book. I had, you, I can't, you can't make a book about American speech top to bottom without reflecting how politicians have used that speech. And Donald Trump is, so I You included, can't pretend he didn't exist. And I put all the tweets that he ever used during his four years in, in, in the White House about CNN, which takes a lot of space in the book, mm -hmm. and they are not particularly inspiring. But <laughs> inspiring. a few people um, said, if Donald Trump is in the book, we would not be in the book. Prominent people, I, I should not mention. Their names. I don't want to know. And I, I found myself in the position of persuading them to be in a book that Donald Trump would be in, in defending Donald Trump, though I have the same reaction, cut reaction of, oh, with the language. Religion. Religion. In other words, we can't be near this person. The religion. That's exactly what I mean. Do any, this, this comes from uh, people online who are watching us um, or will be watching us. Uh, do any Asian American uh, audiences write to you? Um, how about people who are in their 20s? Your imagined audience is all in their 50s. I guess the question here is, do you communicate with a, lo a young audience? Uh, does, the, does the Times communicate with a young audience? And, and John McWhorter. What an interesting question. I hear from plenty of people who are much younger than Shira and Rhonda. And I must admit, I don't write thinking of people my students age. I guess I'm writing thinking of people my own age. But then, when I was in my 30s, I was writing thinking of people in their 50s. I'm, what, what is it about this <laughs> particular age? Because you've been around long enough to remember another time, yeah. but you're not, I'm 58, I'm not ready to call myself old, but you're, you're seasoned. Yeah, seasoned. And so I guess I've always thought I was writing yeah. for the seasoned. Um, Asian, persons seldom not much I never thought about it until right now but many people under 30 and yet I must admit I'm always writing for this person who's drinking coffee and reading the Atlantic mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to think about that well I, I, another part of it is that at this age you know that you're nowhere near them anymore I'm my students are I had to ask what clutch meant yesterday. I'm beginning to lose. See, they know. I'm losing their slang. Yeah. So part of it is I don't write to them because I'm thinking they're seeing a whole different world. Mm -hmm. But I need to think about that. Yeah. yeah. There's a good one here. <coughs> uh, maybe it will be the last or one of the last. Uh, what about the word so at the start of a sentence? <laughs> that always comes up. Um, I did a, um, an episode of my podcast, Lexicon Valley, on so, where I use examples from old radio on, and I was demonstrating that it's not new, it's something that you see way back in the 1970s. Some people have said that it's a contribution from Yiddish, from Jewish speakers at the turn of the last century. Oh, really? I could not nail that down. I had always assumed that it was something like, so you want to be an artist, or something, but I couldn't, I couldn't uh, nail it down. Yeah. And... Before it was so, it was well. And you can see it, or you can hear it on old radio talk shows, and then you can look at talk shows in the 50s and 60s, where today we would say so, they would say well. But they didn't say nothing. Yeah. So there is a tendency to introduce what you're going to say with some sort of transition word like that, which is what linguists call a discourse marker. But the important thing about so is that I hear, 
you know, practically once every two weeks that it's new, that it's something that started like in 2010, but it goes back much okay. further. Than that. There are lots of questions here, but let's, let's conclude with this one, John. That is a, 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 an, an invitation to be autobiographical. Uh -oh. uh, when, when did you realize that words were your, your, your partners, but your, your topic, that you wanted to study, you wanted to write about words? When did you come to, um, to the realization that your role was to reflect on how our language is used? I'm going to give you an honest answer to that the question. The first one, right? The first one to say. The first yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being consulted about words and about English is something I'm used to now because if you are a linguist and you drift, and for me everything is drifting, but if you drift into being a media pundit, you quickly find that what people want to know is the language that they speak. It's supposed to be about English. I was not terribly interested in English until the late 90s because I already speak it. It was, it was too close to home. My interest in languages was other languages. I've become interested in words, but to an extent, it's probably even detectable. Why are people using so? That's not something I would wake up thinking about. I've learned to become interested in that. Mm. But where it really hit me, it was Shirley. It's a girl named Shirley. And she, um, we, we had these piano lessons when I was five. And she and I used to walk around holding hands. We really liked each other. And it's 1970. It's Philadelphia. We did not live in a neighborhood with any Latino people. And so I had never heard another language. No one talked about it. My parents were both monolingual English. I thought there was one language. I didn't think that there could be more than one of this thing called a language. So Shirley and I, I want to say Shirley and me, walk upstairs. <laughs> and Shirley goes over to her parents, and I go over to my mother. And all of a sudden, I'm noticing that Shirley's over there, and I can't understand what she's saying. I'd never experienced that. My blood pressure goes up even now at how that felt. I can't understand, and I don't know what a stroke is. So I wasn't thinking I'm sick, but I was thinking, <laughs> what is she doing? And I remember thinking, not what are those words. It was, what is that stream? What's coming out of her mouth? And then watching the adults. And I started crying because I felt left out. And I said, Mom, what, what happened to her? And so my mother, this is not what she would ordinarily have done, but she walked over and she asked them, what are you doing? Oh, no, she didn't say that. She went over and she asked, what language are you speaking? Yeah. They were Israeli. They were speaking Hebrew. So she came over and she said, they're speaking Hebrew. And I said, what's, a, what's an Hebrew? And she said, well, they're Jewish. And I said, well, why can't we speak Hebrew? And she said, well, we're not Jewish. Jughead, get in the car. <laughs> and so got in the car. I'm still crying. That was the beginning of it because I wouldn't let it go. Yeah. And I went to Montessori schools, and at my Montessori school then, it just happened that it was adjacent to a synagogue. And so I was talking to one of my teachers about this Hebrew thing that came out of Shirley's mouth. And the teacher was nice enough to go get a sheet from one of the rabbis of the Hebrew alphabet. I still have it framed in my office. About 10 years ago, I realized, wait, this is the Yiddish alphabet, and they didn't think I was going to notice, <laughs> which I didn't until I was 48. Oh. But it's the Hebrew alphabet. And somebody taught me that it goes backwards. Yeah. And so my mother got me this, your first Hebrew dictionary with these little sentences. And so I could go like, ak, shav. When I was about seven, I realized I didn't know what these words meant. And then I was just kind of stuck. And I didn't cry then. I was a little bit more mature. And I've messed around with Hebrew since then. But it was that. It was like, th this girl I love, suddenly there's this stuff coming out of her mouth. And so I can't have her. I love this. That was the beginning. And Shirley, I've told that story. And somebody told Shirley, who still exists. And about seven years ago, we got to know each other again online. And we have absolutely nothing in common. Right. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> But we are back in touch. It was Shirley who gave me linguistics. Fantastic. Beautiful. <laughs> John, I, it's been once again a delight to schmooze. Now the word is even better. Oh, hope I didn't go on too long. No, <laughs> with you, uh, John's books are available outside. <coughs> Amher's books uh, uh, brought them, and we thank them, and we thank everybody for coming, both 
Thank you, in person and online, and come to the next event. It will be with the president and editor-in-chief of Merriam-Webster to talk about what dictionaries do to us and what we do to dictionaries. Thank you so much. Thank you.